My name's Michael, and this is All Departments. Here come the cherries, and we're heading for the top of the tree. Bournemouth is a team that's going to show Division 3. Here come the leaders and the scorers at the full Saturday. Showing how to win the Southern Way. So we say, come on, Bournemouth. Come on, Bournemouth. While you're out there winning, hear the shouting and the singing. We sing, come on, Bournemouth. Come on, Bournemouth. Here come the cherries. Here come the cherries. Welcome to all departments. Our cherry season might be well and truly over, but the silly season is in full swing. Top scorer Lewis Grabman has taken himself off on holiday and no doubt thrown his phone into the sea so he can have a well-earned break from his agent bending his ear every five minutes about a transfer. Steve Cook has stated on the South End website that he will be staying at Dean Court despite being linked with a move to Premier League Burnley. Coventry's Callum Wilson has been touted as a possible replacement for Lewis Graben, as a Celtics Greek international Giorgio Samaras, with the cancellation of our friendly against Rangers adding fuel to that particular fire. New signing Dan the Goose Gosling will be looking forward to facing his old club Everton in pre-season, with Wales leading club Swansea City also rumoured as possible opponents. The match day programme topped the table in the Championship Awards, whilst we are all crossing our fingers that a hike in season ticket prices will lead to an even more than 20% increase in our final league position at the end of next season. Like most young lads, when I was growing up, the players I used to watch at Dean Court seemed closer to superheroes than normal everyday human beings. Despite much water passing under the bridge in the years since, I still see those players from the early 80s as titans in the history of our wonderful club. Amongst them was Milton Graham, a man who wrote his name into Dean Court history 30 years ago, and I'm thrilled to say he joins us on the phone now. Milton, welcome to all departments. Hello, Michael. So, we'll talk about your glory days at Dean Court in a minute. But first of all, tell us about your early days as a footballer. I know you were born in London and you spent some time with Chelsea and Spurs. How did you end up coming to Dean Court? Well, we we got to a school cup final. It was the um, national trophy. And we had quite a decent team between, um, oh, what would they call it nowadays, year... Six and seven, I think it is. I'm not sure. I was uh, around 12, 13 going on. And um, we got to a national final. And I'd been at Chelsea and Spurs in the schoolboy setup, but probably thought I'd arrived um, and, and, and didn't do the right thing, shall we say. <clears throat> yeah, so sort of taught me a lesson. Um, anyway, we played this cup final. Uh, and they picked three of us to come from London to go to Bournemouth, come down for a trial. I had two weeks down there and then got told at the end of the two-week trial that I wasn't quite good enough or wasn't better than what they had. So I got the train back to London in tears. Um, I then got a phone call two weeks later to play in a FA Youth Cup game against Southampton. Um, went back down, played, and straight after the game, they said, we want to offer you an apprenticeship. Started from there. Brilliant. And who was the manager then? Was it Dave Webb? Dave Webb was the manager, yeah. Yeah. Um, the scary Dave Webb. Was he scary in the dressing room, was he? Yeah, yeah. He he, he just had a presence about him. That, I mean, he was a big guy anyway. Um, and he just had this presence that if you saw him coming down the corridor, you'd probably duck into another room. <laughs> you were very young then and he'd had quite a significant career in the game already but you made good progress after you came to the club my understanding is it was around May 1981 and then you made your debut in October 81 against Berry. you scored two goals on your debut yeah the first one within nine minutes so it sort of um, it, it settled me uh, because he told us to team on the Thursday 
So I rung everyone in London and said, look, I'm playing Saturday, I'm playing Saturday, I'm going to make my debut. Um, and within nine minutes, I'd scored and should have scored a hat-trick, really. Um, scored later on in the game, but should have scored a hat-trick. But yeah, it was a great start. Absolute great start for me. It was me. a great start. And you only made five appearances in total that season, but you managed to get three goals, so you got another one in those five games. We got promoted that season. Did you get injured? Was that why you didn't make as many appearances? No, um, I think it was... Um, I got in the side because we did have injuries. Um, and it was, you know, put me in and then bring me back out sort of thing. Um, again, I'd gone in, scored two goals, and I think I'd scored three goals in four games, something like that. And then we, we played a midweek game. Um, we were losing at half time, and I, and I wasn't playing that well. And that's when I got my first ever rollicking, shall we say. Um, you know, so he was putting me in the side and then taking me out of the side. Um, and it was a learning curve for me. You're obviously quite a fast learner because you certainly made a difference when you did get onto the pitch. And then in the following season, you played, according to the statistics, 19 league games. You got a couple of goals. I think they were both in the same game against Cardiff. And That's right. That season, we also played for the first time in the 1980s, Man United. I think you played in one of those games. I think it was the one at Dean Court where we drew 2-2. Do you remember much about that? No, not really. I think I was on the um, bench for that game. I think I came on. I'm not sure. I can't really remember that one. But yeah, I do remember playing them and then um, during the game and thinking, God, we should have won that really. So, you know, it was it was probably a, a premonition for what was going to come later on. <laughs> and then Dave Webb moved on and Harry Redknapp took his first managerial role and his very first game, and this has gone down in infamy in, in Bournemouth folklore, was a 9-0 defeat away at Lincoln, where we <clears> were <throat> ill-advised in terms of what boots to wear. Footwear, because exactly. Because it was all frozen, wasn't it? It was crazy. Yeah, well, we, we went overnight, got up, it was frozen. We'd gone to the ground early, so they went out and got us this footwear to say, like, this will be all right, and we couldn't stand up. It was literally, we couldn't stand up. You, you couldn't run and had the correct footwear on. And before you know it, it was 9-0. And to be fair, it could have been about 16. Kenny Allen, I know he let in nine, but he, 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 he was brilliant on the day, really. It could have been a lot more. <laughs> a lot more, yeah. Um, that wasn't a good coach trip back. No, I bet. And then no. Harry's first spell as caretaker came to an end. I think you wanted the job, but Don Megson came in for a little while and then he didn't last that long uh, and then Harry took over again. What was it like working with Harry in those days? He's just a fantastic uh, motivator, a great understanding of football um, and, and just taught me a lot of basics, which you think are basics now I look back. But it's a, it's an art to it, you know, uh, how to manage people. And, and I still take a lot of what he's taught me into my into the future, into different jobs, mm -hmm. you know, how to treat people. Um, it, you know, he can be a bit fiery. I have seen him lose his temper a few times. Um, but what a great coach. Great coach. And then it wasn't long before the glory arrived for Harry and for yourself because... In January 1984, as we all know, you scored the first goal in our 2-0 win over Manchester United. That must have been a very proud moment in your career. That was a, a very proud moment. You know, I still get people who I meet to this day and, and we'll talk um, and someone will say, I, oh, you know, you used to play football and some people look it up on Wikipedia and then come and ask me later on just to make sure. Um, yeah, it was it's fantastic. You know, it's just one of them things you, you'll never forget. Uh, great day. Um, we should never have beaten them really on paper when you see the, the team they had out. But yeah, we you know we turned out victors. Do you remember much about your goal? Yeah, I, I, I mean I tell everyone it was about twenty yards, but in, <laughs> in effect it was only a yard. Um, it was quite acrobatic, <laughs> but, though, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, but it was something we'd worked on. Again, a basic little uh, walk back from the far post. 
in case the keeper does spill it or doesn't catch it or it comes off from a flick on and it just landed perfect. Well, it was in the air, but it just come to me perfectly. You know, and it was something we had worked on in training, yeah, which was good. All the photos I've seen, and I've obviously seen the, the, the clips as well, Gary Bailey is kind of in midair and he's pulling that face that everybody does when they think they're going to get kicked in the face. And his yeah. hair is all up in the sky and you're completely <laughs> in midair with your, uh, your body kind of sideways, doing the sideways kick. And yeah, it does look very spectacular. Yeah, but it's only a yard out. <laughs> but, yeah, it's well, only a yard out. About but... it today, 30 years on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, I was, um... Somewhere a, a, a guy you worked with, maybe this has happened more than once, didn't believe you, and then uh, the next day he came in to apologise. Yeah, he came up to apologise. I mean, he asked me the question, because people, you know... Who, who know the name as such. Um, and when I was in Peterborough, so they'd obviously known me there, um, I went and worked at a place and he'd come up and he spoke to me and said, um, are you Milton Graham? I said, yeah. Um, you've played football and you scored against Man United, so I'm told. I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> so, you know, I just walked off as, as if to say, look, I haven't got to explain myself. I'm not going to. Um, the next couple of days, he's come back to me and said, oh, I'm ever so sorry. Um, talk me through the game and I said no mate I'm just going to walk on I may have sounded a bit arrogant but I you know I, I didn't need to explain myself to him but it, it's something you can't lie about no well he only needs to tune into the uh, the greatest cup shocks that comes around every January and he'll see your goal on that one I always enjoy watching those ones and then the same season we had our winning run in the inaugural associate members cup which was a competition that was run on a slightly different way in those days because we played six games, including the final. The first tie was in February, but three of the, of the games, the final three, the Southern semi-final, the semi-final, and of course the final itself, were all played within the space of 10 days in May after the league season had finished. Do you remember much about that? No, I don't, actually. I, the worst thing about that, for me, the Associate Members Cup was, it was supposed to be at Wembley that year, wasn't it? And they changed it and said they're going to play at Hull City. Um, and the next year, from then onwards, it's all played at Wembley. Yeah, it was played <laughs> at Hull. Booberry, yeah, yeah. yeah, Park, yeah. Because Booberry Park, of yeah. the year show had taken place at Wembley and the pitch was wrecked, apparently. And oh, I didn't know that was the reason. Yeah, no. that, that's that's what I've read. I don't remember that from the time I was quite young. And I, when I spoke to Ian Thompson, he said he thought it was the toss of the coin that decided whether it was at Dean Court or Boothbury Park. But yeah, like you say, we have been to the final once since then, and every single one since has been played at Wembley or Cardiff. At Wembley, Apart yeah. from that one. But, uh, <laughs> and do you remember much about the Southern Area final against Millwall? Because again, when I spoke to Ian Thompson, he said that there were some late decisions in that game and the Millwall fans became very irate and the referee was kind of advising everybody to go over and stand near the tunnel and then he was going to blow the whistle. Yeah, it, it was it was terrible, really. Because uh, it, it, I took a penalty. I'm sure that was the one that went to penalties, wasn't it? And we... I think it ended up 2-1 or so, but we won it on penalties. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we did. Anyway... I was one of the penalty takers, but it was into the Millwall end. And I remember walking up to take the penalty and just seeing, and you, and you can imagine what they were singing at that time, mm. how bad that area was. Um, and I took the penalty and I, I scored it and I saw a fist pump. And all in one motion, they all lent. And they used to have a big bit of fencing up there where they couldn't get through but they looked to me as though they were going to get through so I turned and jogged back <laughs> quickly but you had to go out that way to or go back that way to go out uh, to the changing rooms mm. and that was quite um, horrible to be fair quite that was heavy. nasty yeah this is yeah, good, yeah it was nasty a good point to ask you about your experiences as a black player during that era because Things have improved to some extent these days. But back then, I mean, I was very young. I was probably about 11 years old, and I stood on the south end, and I'd see grown men, some of whom I actually knew, 
and kind of in, in a way look to for moral guidance doing the old monkey chants and all that nonsense yeah i, I couldn't believe it really because i was being taught yeah. this is all wrong and obviously i felt it was wrong and and it, it was going around me you, you must have seen and heard some really nasty things Oh, it's terrible. I mean, bad behaviour is taught, isn't it, like that? So you're right in saying the young kids, uh, they're going to grow up exactly the same way because that's all they know. Um, but there was one really standout thing for me, um, and I was, it wasn't being caught. Again, we were playing Millwall, and they brought that many fans that they had to sit in the stand. So I don't know if you remember, just by the change room, that's where we got our family tickets, and that's where the wife sat and the mm -hmm. kids and that. And my wife was sitting with uh, my son. He would have been about three years of age then. And, he, and they were singing and shouting stuff about me. And my wife got up and said something back to them. And these were men that had got tickets to come and sit by us, mm -hmm. you, you know, sit by the families and that. And she got up and said something to them. And the rest of the Bournemouth people that were sat with her like stood up and applauded her and from then they they were quiet about it mm. it, it, it was it, you know it's awful your your dad's out there playing and they're calling him uh names <laughs> um I, I i had a couple of times at hereford united as well i shouldn't name clubs but i i did where they threw the old banana in the corner flag and and stuff like that uh and and some names and and it was difficult because in them days it was thought that black players, you know, didn't try, didn't like the cold, couldn't tackle, could always run. And, and I was all the opposite to that. So <laughs> it, it, it was difficult. It was very difficult, but uh, strong character. And you had people to look up to, like, you know, the likes of Viv Anderson and John Barnes, mm. who were playing international football. You, you know, it was, it was, there was someone to look up to and say, if they can do it, so could I. Absolutely. And did the manager or anybody around the club ever say anything to you about it? Or was it just a case of, and I don't really like saying this, but the attitude being, we just got to get on with it and prove them wrong? No, you know, we never really spoke about it as such. I, I, I don't ever remember um, any of my managers pulling me to one side and saying, that's wrong, you need to get on with it. And, you know, don't listen to it. I, I don't remember that. It was, it was sort of accepted, mm. you know. I'm not saying they thought it was right. It, it was just accepted that that was a part of the game and and you'd grow up and, and deal with it, you, you know, where I knew some players that, that just couldn't deal with it. Yeah, and no surprise there. But you did deal with it in the right way on the pitch and going on to, on to happier things. Once we saw Millwall off in that Southern Area final, it was three days later the final was uh, up at Boothbury Park. We won 2-1. There isn't really much of a record in terms of any footage that I've been able to track down or match reports, but you scored, I think they scored first, didn't they? And, yeah, they scored first. And then you scored the equaliser. Do you remember anything about your goal? I do, because it, it, was, it would have been, a, I don't know, three weeks maybe four weeks previous, there's a great Glenn Hoddle goal against Watford where he, he like does a Johan Cruyff flick and chips it in the far post. Mm. And it was exactly the same, but on the other side. <laughs> but it was on the other side. Um, and, you know, it's only when you rung or text and said about doing the interview that I thought, God, that was one of my really good goals, that was, thinking about it. Yeah, um, and I remember it vividly. But that's exactly what happened. But if it had been Glenn Odder who did it again, it would have been really talked about, you know, <laughs> as it was. But, yeah, it was, it was a really good goal. And then, so, yeah, I remember that. Later mm. in the game, Paul Morrell got the winner. I think it was in the 72nd minute, according to my book of statistics here. And... Was it a tough game? Was it as close as it sounds, or were we in charge? It was a tough game, because they were a big, big, strong side. Do you remember um, Billy Whitehurst? I do. They big had, um, cent Steve big McLaren centre McLaren forward. Well, didn't they? The, uh, Steve McLaren played, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. went on to be England manager yeah. as well, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, but Billy Whitehurst was a big beast, uh, strong. Yeah, it was a, a real tough game. 
um, and, and we sort of come through and won it. And then, it was great. How were you presented with the cup? Was it on the pitch or in the dressing room? I think it was on the pitch. We stood around, had a chat, um, and then it was presented on the pitch um, and got, I think, I'm sure my eldest son has still got the medal for it because he took all, all my, my medals and that. I'm sure he's got it. These days, teams seem to have open top bus celebrations when they get a point away from home. But back then, it seemed to be a bit more, <laughs> more low-key. But was there any yeah. recognition in the town? Did you get a reception with the mayor or anything like that? No, we, we went back to the ground. I, I suppose we got congratulated by the fans. We, we didn't go on an open-top bus because it, it was... I mean, people used to call it the Mickey Mouse Cup as well, you know. Um, but it was it was the trophy that we'd won and deserved to win. Um, I suppose we did get a bit of recognition, um, but not, you know, no open top bus or anything like that. <laughs> I've still got a, got a pennant in my loft, AFC Bournemouth Associate Members Cup winners 1984. Maybe I'll get that down and hang it in my son's bedroom after I chat him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good, good, and then the good. following year, which I think was your last year with us, you played about 20 games. And we had quite a good run defending the trophy. I think we got to the the Southern semi-final. I was at this game. I, I remember it quite clearly, actually, because it was quite a bright April evening. And we lost 3-2 at home to Brentford. I think that might have been your last game for the club, was it? Yeah, I'd... Is it another game? I think we should have won. Really, um, I, I'm I'm not too. I'm just trying to think of the opposition who would have been playing for them, and I can't. The, the, uh, well, the big centre half who he was, he's assistant manager now at Crystal Palace. Right. He was doing a job before. I'm trying to think of his name, and I can't. Nice. But he was a big centre half, uh, blonde hair lad. Oh, I can't think. But yeah, um, yeah, I think we should have won the game again. And it, it was, uh, it did go on to be my last season. And then you left for Chester. How did the move to Chester come about? Did Harry just say that someone's come in for you or was your contract up or what happened? Well, I'd just, I'd gone on holiday um, and I got a phone call at the hotel saying that Someone wants to speak to you, a club wants to speak to you. Um, it was, I had, I believe, West Bromwich Albion, which was weird. Mm. They wanted to talk to me. Um, anyway, I came back and then I went up to, to Chester. Didn't know where it was, didn't have a clue. Went up and spoke to the manager, uh, Harry McNally, a great guy, another great manager. Um, and more or less signed straight away. It was a change. He wanted me. He told me uh, he wanted me to play and where to play, and um, loved every minute of Chester. Yeah, loved every minute, even uh, even though I got injured there. But it was a lovely, lovely place. Great club. Yeah, you were very popular with the fans, I understand, and you got promoted in 1986. The first year. First yeah, yeah, yeah. The first year we. It, it was a team that was sort of put together. Um, but we had this camaraderie that, that, you know, we did quite a bit on the pitch and off the pitch as well. So with wives and girlfriends, uh, it was really run like a family. So we were quite close. Mm. So that, you know, as well as being able to play a, a really, really good side. And yeah, got promoted in the first year. Didn't you have a bit of a cup run the following year as well? Well, we played, we got, to, I think it was a fourth round and played Sheffield Wednesday uh, and should have, again, we should have beaten them at home. We were 1-0 for a long, long way of the game and Lee Chapman scored with about 10 minutes to go to equalise and then we had to go to Hillsborough and got beat 3-1. And then yeah. moved on in, I think, the summer of 1989 to Peterborough. You didn't play much, did you? you mentioned your injury... But wasn't Ray Goal there voted one of the best ever scored at London Road? Well, it's second behind um, George Best. <laughs> yeah, he, he, um, 
it was a weird game. We played Exeter, and the guy, a guy playing for them, uh, we went to school together and right. hadn't seen each other for a long time. He was an apprentice at Bournemouth as well. Okay. Um, and we'd gone our different ways, and, and he was playing, and he scored on that day, and then I scored on that day as well. So it was, it was weird. Yeah, and it's been voted second best goal scored at London Road. And that was better than your goal in the Associate Members Cup final, was it? I don't think it was because it was just a straight strike. You know, I caught it sweetly. Um, I think what it was as well, I'd come on a sub, so I was a bit angry at being left out, to be honest. <laughs> your career came to a bit of an early conclusion. I think you were, what were you, 29 when it finished? 29, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was an ankle injury that had been troubling you for some time was it well yeah again it was a, a simple tackle we'd, we'd play the uh, Cardiff and I got a, a kick in my ankle um, and normally a kick you get up and you run it off so I tried that um, didn't work so I came off anyway went back to Peterborough was on the treatment table for three weeks no swelling um, but I, I just couldn't walk on it Eventually, I, I did have an x-ray early, but it didn't bring up anything. And then I had a scan, and it showed that I had a crack mm. right in my talus bone, which is quite deep into the ankle. Mm. Um, operated, but he'd uh, tightened my ligaments too much, and I, I couldn't get a full range of movement, so I was constantly in pain. So I had to retire. But you've been carrying that injury for a while, so is it just the fact that You've been playing in pain. You couldn't play as much as you wanted to, and you couldn't reach the level that you knew you needed to to stay in the pro game that persuaded you to exactly. perform. No, no, that was the reason. It wasn't because the manager said to you, do you know what, I don't think you can cope no. anymore at this level. No, it, it was my decision. Uh, you know, I felt as though I couldn't compete anymore. Um, the impact of it, I didn't realise how bad it was going to have on me that I had to stop playing because, it, you know, it was all I knew, really. Um, but, yeah, I, I'd made that decision because I, I just couldn't I couldn't continue at that level. I then took about two years off and the ankle felt OK. And there was a big centre forward um, at Peterborough left, Les Lawrence, and he was running a, a local side. He said, come down, have a knockabout and see how you are. Mm. So I went and played non-league for a while and it sort of got better, but I was okay at that level. You know, so, and, and I played a few games for various clubs. Mm, you were at Paul Townsend until, for a while, weren't you? Yeah, I went to Paul Down. Do you remember Bri uh, Brian Chambers? I do, yeah. He, was he playing played at that time that yeah. you were playing for Bournemouth, wasn't he? That's right. He rang me and said, look, come down, I've heard you started playing again, come down and have a few games with us, and I travelled down and played, and then travelled back, um, and that was good, that was good, I enjoyed that, but then again, uh, you know, as playing at that standard, it was quite a decent standard, I was getting too much pain after games, mm. so I dropped down again, where I could not coast through games, but didn't, you know, I had a couple of young lads running around me, and I could just play and pass it, and and so until it got to a stage where I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing myself any justice here. People were saying or looking at me thinking, yeah, Milton Graham used to play pro football, but doesn't look like a pro footballer anymore. <laughs> so, you, you know, I had to call it a day. Yeah, it's a difficult decision. And did you manage to stay in the game in any other capacity or were you just forced to go out and find work? No, I, I went out and got work. Um my two lads, the eldest one, should have gone on and played, but went down another route. He was really talented. Um, and my youngest one now is just uh, signing at Oxford United right. on scholarship. So, yeah, he'd been at Leicester for five years, and, and they said he wasn't quite what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so he's signing for Oxford. How old is he? He's 16. All right, we might see him in the next few years then. And, Hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. And do you manage to keep in touch with how the Cherries are getting on these days? Do you see us play ever? I don't watch them live, but if they're on telly, I watch them. I've still got a soft spot for them. Mm. Um, all my old clubs, really, but yeah. especially Bournemouth, where I started off. 
you know, it, it's nice to see. The ground looks fantastic. Um, they are a decent side now as well, aren't they? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, they are a decent side. We've had mm. some good years very recently, which have been preceded by well, quite a lot of tough years. I mean, it was financially we were a mess when you were playing for us, but I yeah. think that we hit rock bottom then the nineties and then again in the two two thousands, the first decade of of this century. But these days. Things are looking a lot more rosy, uh, certainly on the pitch. And like you say, the ground is uh, well. The ground's completely different. It was rebuilt since since, since your day. Have you, yeah. ever, have you ever visited the new ground? No, never. I've been past it, but I never. If I've gone to, I, I went back to Bournemouth. God, God, it's got to be a few years back now to see my old la- um, lady Wells in Dinks. Oh, your landlady, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I went back to see her um, and had a chat and that, but I didn't go to the ground. Is that right? Well, you'll have to come down one day. And yeah, I will do. It'd be brilliant. Yeah. Celebrate your, your contribution to the club. You didn't play for us for, for many years, but as I said to you when we first spoke, you were a bit of a legend around the schoolyard when I was a young man, and it's been a pleasure talking to you this evening. It's been, you. It's been brilliant to hear about all the old days and those important goals that you scored for us that are always remembered around Dean Court. So thanks ever so much for coming on the show, Milton, and hopefully we'll see you at the court soon. Cheers, Michael. Brilliant to hear from Milton there. I hope I didn't sound too starstruck when we were talking. If you want to hear any of the previous interviews we've had in all departments, check out the website at www.alldepartments.wordpress.com where I've added an interview archive on the sidebar featuring the likes of Jeff Mostyn, John Williams, Tommy Elphick and Milton's old teammate Ian Thompson. If you'd like to get in touch, email alldepartmentspodcast at gmail.com and you can follow on Twitter at alldepartments. That's about it for now. The next episode should be out in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, enjoy the sunshine and we'll play out with Eddie's Army by Sounds Like Adam, which, recorded just a year ago, makes it easily the most recent addition to my small pile of cherry red records. Yet, as we await what appears to be a season of Premier League or bust, it already sounds like an historical document. So up the cherries in all departments and goodbye!
was a little bit of a fantasy has turned into a real dream and the, and the reality. It's incredible. As a supporter, you want success so much. You want to see the club move on. Uh, thankfully, we've given that to a really loyal group of supporters.